I had a really unusual consultation recently. Now, most people who book my consultations either own a house and want to change it in some way, or they're looking to buy a house, and before they decide to buy it, they want to know if it's possible to make the changes they need. So we have an actual property to talk about. This one was totally out of the blue. It was a young couple who lived in London, and one of them had severe allergies. They wanted to know what kind of materials typically went into making up buildings in the UK. They weren't from the UK and they were looking to buy their first home. I had to say, well, I'm not a medical professional. I can't advise you about allergies. And they said, that's okay. They, we know what we're allergic to. If you just show us what goes into a building, we can make our own mind up. It's fair enough. So I set up a slideshow for them. I'm going to share it with you guys now. Looking at buildings that I've altered from the uh, Georgian era, around 1800, to the Victorian era, late 19th century, to the 1930s, 1960s, and up to the modern era. Over time, different materials got used, different methods of construction got used, and I was able to explore this with them. So it was an, it was an educational experience for me to hear from these guys what kind of materials tended to affect them and in what way. You know, I've met people who've had allergies to food and to animals, but I've never actually met someone who's allergic to materials in a building, and, and this guy's allergies seemed to be quite severe. So what we started off with was an older building. Uh, this building was built just after the 1800s. It's, a, it's over 200 years old and it has a traditional timber pine floor. And you can see there are gaps because over time the boards have shrunk and there's, you know, space has developed between them. And I pointed out that underneath these, typically there would be an ash deafening. So this is just whatever material the contractor had lying around, ash, rubble, whatever, and they would fill in the gaps between the big timber joists with this substance. And it's fine if it's left alone, but I know that if you mess about with these floors, that can come up through the cracks. You can you can get it through your hoover, we'll start hoovering it up, and you'll wonder where is it coming from? It's coming from down there. And I know that dust can affect people, and they were particularly interested in, in this. So I don't think they've been aware of that in buildings from the Georgian and Victorian era. I think we kind of stopped using that stuff maybe in the middle of the 20th century. This uh, is the same building and it has a stone slab and you can see that underneath it there's, you know, a sand uh, lime mixture. That's dusty. That can come up through the cracks. You know, as long as you leave this stuff alone, it's probably fine. This is lath and plaster and you can see these little wooden strips. That's the lath and over the top of it would then be put plaster. Now the lath are just timber strips. They're very narrow timber strips and they are nailed onto the structural timbers to form a sort of woven mesh and then someone would mix up lime mortar and horse hair traditionally and they would plaster over this and that's what you know the inner surface of your walls and ceilings would be made from. Now I've been told during a health and safety training session I went to once that there is a very small risk of anthrax with this stuff if you mess with it because it contains animal fibers though apparently nobody in the UK has ever contracted anthrax as a result of working from it, but it does exist as, as an issue. But I do know that if you cut into this, because I've done it any number of times on projects over the years, it gets very dusty very quick. And sometimes the walls inside older buildings are made from brick, sometimes they're made from timber frame. This is, you know, traditional 200-year-old brick. It has lime mortar, again, perfectly fine until you drill into it, and then that dust can become an irritant. This is what lath and plaster looks like in practice if you really smash into it, because the weave kind of stays together it doesn't come off the wall in bits, it comes off in large sort of slabs that tear apart. You know, when we start knocking into buildings, you get an enormous amount of rubble, it has to be bagged up and taken away. So I have to explain to them the reality of altering a building. If they were aspiring to buy somewhere to do some work to it, this is the kind of environment they would find themselves in. So that's a building from the early 1800s. But the same method of construction continued right through the 19th century into the early 20th century. So this is a house from the 1930s in Edinburgh. And instead of stone walls, it uses brick. But the underfloor area, this is important. This is a suspended underfloor. You can see we built an extension around this. That void under the floor can cause problems with mold. And I know that mold affects some people who have allergies as well. If they were going to buy a ground floor property, could be a flat, could be a house, doesn't matter. And it had a suspended timber floor or a solum or a void underneath it. You have to make sure that that is ventilated. The way to check is to see if these things, air bricks, are on the outside of the house. Sometimes they're made from clay, the same stuff the brick is made from. Sometimes they're cast iron. You can even get plastic ones. This is what a modern one looks like. So your floor would be just here. That would be the ground floor of your property. And there's a sort of void underneath. And you can see in this photograph, this is inside that house, when we broke the floor, that's what the void looks like down there. In, in this particular case, it's only, you know, about that much. But air has to keep flowing through it. Otherwise, damp will build up and mold and fungus will start growing. And the mold and fungus can really upset some people with allergies. I did know that much. And they were quite interested in this. So as long as you're buying a property where the vents 
are in good condition. Sometimes they've been blocked. Sometimes people do landscaping outside their properties and block them. Sometimes if the solum is big enough to walk around in, you know, like a basement or whatever, people might put something up against it or block it from the inside in some way. You have to make sure these things are vented. I've actually built new buildings with this technology, with a suspended timber ground floor and a void underneath it. In older buildings, they wouldn't be insulated. So there's no barrier between you and the damp air underneath. But in modern buildings, we do insulate it. We put a vapor barrier in and that's all good. But even still, it's possible to block these things. And if you have a timber floor, then the timber can start to rot. So there's other, there's other things beyond merely health. There's the actual safety of the fabric of the building if these air bricks are blocked. And the regulations have a certain amount of ventilation for every linear meter around the perimeter of the building. So you have to have a certain number of these things installed. So that's a 1930s house. This is a house that was built in the late 60s, early 70s. And at this point in the UK, you begin to see insulation being put into things. It, prior to that, you know, insulation was just not something people bothered with. Cavity walls had come along in the late 19th, early 20th century. That was a big improvement. But it was only in the mid 20th century you start people actually putting insulation into buildings. Trouble with this stuff is, this is glass wool. And it's literally made from recycled glass or sometimes, you know, brand new glass, whatever. It's melted and spun out like sort of cotton wool. And uh, it's it's a pretty good insulant. But animals can get in there and start burrowing into it and start living in it. And when we opened up this house, we found, you know, mice nests, possibly rats, that sort of thing. They like using it for that. So in older buildings, particularly ones that haven't been lived in for a while, you can, you can have creatures up there, insects as well. And it can attract dust like no one's business. Once... Think the creatures get into this, they start building nests, they bring dust with them, or if the building isn't particularly well cared for, that can become a, a, an issue. And this is from the same building where they had, I think, again, this was some sort of blown cavity insulation. I don't know if that's original, I don't think so, but it probably went in at some point in the 80s or 90s into the cavity wall of that building. Same thing, it can, things can get in there. They can also get damp. Cavity wall insulation, particularly when it's retrospectively fitted into an older building, if it's the blown stuff, can cause other problems. Uh, it can cause a bridge where moisture in the outer leaf of brickwork can then travel across the insulation to make the inside of the building damp. Yet if you're going to build cavity wall insulation, solid blocks of insulation that are built into the building from the get-go, that's the way to do it. And we're now up to the modern era. We're now into what, what are we building today? And this extension here had a solid concrete floor. And onto that, we were putting laminated floor. This is quite a cheap laminated floor. This, this building had to have a budget cut, but you can see this wet brown stuff, that's adhesive. And the client had told me he was allergic to things that had glue. Modern chemical glues can set him off. And you can tell that it's cheap because the boards are short. So it's quite difficult to click these things together. If you're putting them on a concrete floor, it's often best, it's advised that you, you know, glue them or have some sort of adhesive down to the floor when that's being done. With larger, more expensive engineered timber wood flooring, you can click them together. They go onto a sort of underlay, a plastic sheet that could seal in any uh, nasties that might set people off. Another thing he said that bothered him was MDF, which is commonly used in the manufacture of kitchen cabinets, bathroom cabinets, because it does off-gassing. So when it's made, it's impregnated with all sorts of glue. It's basically made up of lots of bits, millions of pieces of uh, sawdust, and they're glued together and compressed with the glue, and they make a sort of board that's very rigid, and it's used in all sorts of things. But that the gas off of that was particularly uh, aggravating to this guy's condition. He actually liked concrete. So there's the concrete slab, there's the insulation, there's a damp proof membrane in there, and then there's the screed over the top of the insulation. So that's all fine and well, that wouldn't be a problem. But if you, ha if you buy an existing building, it is possible to take one of these old floors from you know, way back in the day and to apply a screed over the top of it. It can be done, but it's going to make the floor a bit thicker. So there are latex screeds you can put down to seal all this stuff in. You have to put a membrane over the top of the existing boards or better yet, take them up and put down some sort of um, chipboard sheeting, but the glue in the chipboard itself actually sets him off. So maybe it's just best to put a plastic sheet down and then thin, thin latex screed over the top of that. And, and then the, a discussion happened about what's the difference between glass wool and rock wool or mineral wool. Uh, mineral wool is a denser, harder product. It's made from rocks that are then melted down, they're molten and they're spun into a material that when they cool down, they get much harder, much more rigid. Glass wool is very malleable. You can squash it and squeeze it and push it into spaces uh, and make it fit. Whereas this stuff, you can to an extent ma manipulate it, but it, it tends to be fairly rigid. As to whether it has an impact on someone's health, I couldn't tell you, I have no idea. But this was an eye opener for me. This was not like my usual consultations at all. And I found it very interesting. And it's something I'm going to do a bit more study on, a bit more research. And I'm, you know, as part of my continuing professional development, I'm going to look into this. So if you have a property and you want to talk to me about it, or you're looking to buy a property and you want to know if things are possible with it, you can book a consultation. The link's in my link tree. Check it out.